Good morning, everybody. Boy, am I happy to be here. Just so you know, 1982, we had a Christmas Eve service, had 20 people in it. And it was in the family room of our home over on Tucker Road here in Cheshire. And we had a candlelight service and we had real candles. And if I remember, there was a teenage boy there who lifted his candle very high. We had a low ceiling in the basement and almost set my house on fire. Not the kind of fire you're looking for in church. But uh, I'm so happy to see what the church has become. This church was birthed in prayer that there would be a, a church in Cheshire, Connecticut, based on the foundation of Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. You can build a life upon Jesus. And if you get filled with the Holy Spirit, I mean filled so that the Holy Spirit is in you, you can lead a victorious life, a successful life, an ever-improving life, that God is with us all throughout our life. Now, I've put on a few year, uh, uh, years over the years, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but uh, my wife Gail is here with me, my beautiful wife Gail down here, and it's a second marriage uh, for both of us. She was a, a widow. I was a widower. I won't bore you with the details, but we met online. I call it a high-tech relationship. And uh, we uh, got married, and this coming year, uh, this in uh, the next year, 2024, we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary. <laughs> Praise God. Now, I have a personal goal. I want you to know, I say this everywhere I go. I've said it here before. I plan to live to be 120 years old. Now, you, come on, if you're with me. Now, I just saw this weekend, we, get, we live over in Glastonbury, and they have a local newspaper. On the front page of the paper, they were walking a woman in to church or somewhere, and they put her photograph right on the cover of the local newspaper, and the reason was because she was celebrating her 100th birthday. So if they celebrate somebody's 100th birthday, imagine what they'll do if you reach 120. <laughs> Praise God. Well, you know what? Setting a long-term goal for me means several things. It means I got to keep the Lord in my life so I can stay victorious and keep on growing and staying healthy mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, praise God. And so that's a goal. Today I'm going to be talking on the topic of uh, staying hydrated. And you'll see there's a little twist in this. It has some practical applications, but it also, um, uh, there's a background to this whole story. So I bought my uh, Gatorade with me today, and uh, this is a hydration vessel right here. Um, I found out you could buy Gatorade in tablet form. All you have to do is fill up the bottle with water, put a tablet in there, and you got some Gatorade. So in case you see me later on talking about being hydrated, I brought that so I can stay hydrated. Amen. Are you ready to hear the word of the Lord this morning? Praise God. If you'll put up that first slide, please, uh, in the back. Uh, no, that's the wrong slide. Number one slide says staying high. There we go. Okay, praise God. I'm going to go in the Bible, and whether you follow along in your Bible or not, I brought my Bible with me today, and... Um, and I just want to read something from 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Now, I, I'm going back into the Old Testament, and I'm going to talk about a king named Hezekiah. Anybody ever hear of Hezekiah? There's no book of Hezekiah. Sometimes that's a trick question. Go look, look up Hezekiah, and people go looking for it. He doesn't have his own book in the Bible, but he's a character in the Bible. And he was one of what are called the good kings uh, in uh, Israel back in historically about 3,000 years ago, 2,800 years ago to be exact. There were good kings and there were bad kings. He was a good king. And it says here in uh, 2 Chronicles 29 too that Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. 
His mother's name was Abijah, and his, he was the daughter of Zechariah. And I want to read this verse too. It says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David or his ancestor David had done. Now I'm going to begin by saying this was a king who wanted to bring righteousness to his land, to his country. He wanted to live right, and he wanted the country to live right. He wanted God to have a forefront in people's lives. Now, I trust and I know Pastor Eric, and uh, we've known each other a long time, and that in this church, putting God in the forefront of your life is an important priority. Could somebody say amen to that? I mean, really putting God in first place. That The church is called Cornerstone because you build your life upon God and upon his word. And that, we believe, leads to successful, satisfactory life, not only in the eyes of men, but in the eyes of Almighty God himself. Because God notices when we're trying and striving to live for him. How many of you know that, that God notices? He notices when we're living right, and it's... It, he knows when we've been bad or good. <laughs> so be good for goodness sake. I threw some Christmas in there, I guess, along the way. What he did was when he became king, he began to bring reform to his country. He had the priests who were there. They hadn't been practicing the priesthood the way the Bible had prescribed it. And so he said, look at you fellows, uh, you all got to consecrate yourself. In other words, dedicate yourself afresh to God. Here we come to the end of a year and we're going into a new year. It's a good day today. If you're here today, brothers and sisters, to say, I'm going to consecrate myself to God for the coming year. I'm going to make it a priority to put God first in my life. He also asked them not only to just consecrate, not make a public like a consecration, but also to purify themselves if there was any wrong or evil in their life, to get it right with God and get rid of the bad things that were in their lives. Wherever there was idolatry and witchcraft in the country, he got rid of it. Places of worship, idol worship. He tore down the idols, tore down the statues, and encouraged people to serve the living God. Now, there's something else that he did I find interesting. You see, it was set up that the tribe of Levi, the Levite tribe, was called the priestly tribe. Out of the 12 tribes of Israel, that one tribe was designated that they wouldn't work regular jobs, but they would take care of the temple. They would take care of teaching the people the word of God. And the people were supposed to tithe. They were supposed to give their money in order that the Levites wouldn't have to work in the fields and all. And so they would have uh, uh, their income and their food would come from the donations of the people. And that way, God, people could be fed the word of God because the Levites had time to study and prepare messages like I did for today and then share that with the Lord. So they, they asked the people, they said, look at many of the people haven't been tithing and hadn't been giving their money. And so Hezekiah, I mean the king, the king said, folks, it's time to come on. Let's, let's start giving. Now I know that Pastor Eric shared that uh, this is kind of a, a legacy Sunday. You got a new building program. I've seen the plans. I'm excited about it for the church and for the future of this church. A large children's ministry area for every age level. Fantastic stuff. If we get the little kids filled with the spirit, get the little kids knowing Jesus, why this church is going to have a lifelong legacy. And should the Lord uh, uh, not come back soon, I pray a thousand years from now, that cornerstone stone people are still worshiping the Lord. Hallelujah. So we can establish a legacy. And I'm going to go over to chapter 30 because it's an interesting thing. It says, he ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due the priests and the Levites so they could devote themselves to the law or the word of the Lord. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, oil, and honey, and all that the field produced. They brought a great amount of tithe of everything. And it said there was so much, they gave so much. Listen to this. This is every pastor's dream right here. The people gave so much that they, they didn't have the room to store it in the church, in the temple. And they were putting up heaps of money and food outside the building. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I understand there's something going out about Legacy Sunday and giving. A, and they, they gave so much, they didn't have room in the bank account for it, basically. And they had to assign special people to be accountants and managers for all, for all the money. Now, this is what I call bringing revival to your country when the people start giving to the Lord and all of this. So anyway, he did many other things to consecrate this thing, and, 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 and he was a good king. The end of chapter 31, it says, this is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah during what was good, doing good, what was good and right and faithful before the Lord God. In everything he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. Anybody want to say amen to that? You work hard, you give generously, you serve God faithfully, you consecrate yourself, you purify the people, and teach the people the word of God, and then we get to chapter 32 of this historical book. And this verse jumped off the page the first time I read it. It said, after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah, and he planned to destroy Jerusalem, the capital city. After all that Hezekiah did, he was being attacked by the most powerful empire of its day. And they had already invaded the country. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but this has been somewhat of a difficult year in our family for a couple of reasons. And there's some stuff going on right now that I, I'm not going to share with you. But we're going, my wife and I are going through a number of very burdensome things in our personal lives right now. And, uh, and maybe it's been a difficult year for you, too. And I don't know what 2024 holds. There's wars going on in the Ukraine over in Israel with Hamas and all of this stuff. And we don't know where all, the, where all that's going to lead. And this is the way it is. You, you've done your best and sometimes problems still come your way and difficulties still come your way. And that's why I want to talk to you about staying hydrated today. See, it was after he had done everything, it seemed like the enemy launched the attack. Have you ever done so many things well and you're working hard at, at being pure and living right before God? You're attending church every Sunday and all of a sudden, uh, it's like all hell breaks loose. Problems come your way. Difficulties come your way. I've been in those places and it's, it's no fun. And you say, God, where are you? I've been working so hard and living for you and doing everything right. And now this, now we're being invaded by a foreign enemy. See, and Sennacherib was going to do this. He was going to besiege Jerusalem, means Jerusalem was a walled city. He was going to surround it with his army of over 2,000 men, huge army. And he did this wherever he went. He was going to surround the city of Jerusalem and blockade the city and compel it to surrender. He once besieged Samaria for three years until they capitulated. What was Hezekiah going to do? He was going to surround the city. The problem, you see, was there was no water inside of Jerusalem. The well was outside the city walls. And if they surrounded him, they were going to be in trouble because they would have no water. So next slide, please. I want to call this the significance of water. I don't know if you were aware, I have a degree in biology, so I, I learned some of this stuff. The human body is, uh, the majority of your body is water. How many of you knew that? Did some of you know that here? You know, your skin is like a bag. You're like, it's like a plastic bag. And inside there are all these chemicals. About 60, 70% of your, you is water, you know? You're just all water. That's why we're just bags of water. That's all we are with some chemicals thrown in there. What can I say? And so, uh, so let's take a look at some points of what the significance of staying hydrated. Okay, first point is, next slide, please, that the body depends on water to survive. You cannot live without water. 
you need water. I may need something in that bottle before this sermon is over. And uh, so water makes up more than half your body weight. Every cell, every cell in your body has water in it. Multi-million cells have uh, water in it. And your organs need it. Your brain needs water. If you get dehydrated, the brain stops working. You go stupid. You can't think. You get disoriented. Without water, uh, your legs are cramped. Your arms are cramped. You can see a tennis match that's lost because the player didn't stay hydrated during the match, and all of a sudden they're cramping up, and they can't move. It's because not enough water to lubricate the joints and everything like this. So every cell in your body needs water. Most people need about 14 eight-ounce glasses of water a day. Some need less, some need more, but uh, the average, they say, is about 14. Some people need more, some less. So you need to be drinking water to sustain your body, your blood pressure, everything else. In fact, without water, the body stops working. This fifth point up there, your mouth gets dry. You get thirsty, you get a headache, confused, dizzy. It, the water regulates your body temperature. It aids in digestion. Did, I, I, interesting fact, did you know that your body produces over two quarts of saliva every day? Just so you can di digest your food, there's water needed to digest this food, the enzymes that are in the food. Without water, you can't digest your food. You, you, you can't even spit. You don't have anything to do. All, all, all the, the mucous membranes in your nose are used as a wet, wet filter that filters out all the germs. All of a sudden, that's gone. Your nose is dry and itchy. and You, you just, water, it, water carries oxygen throughout your body. Without water, you don't get oxygen. And if you get too dehydrated, you're, you don't have enough water, your blood starts to lessen the amount of blood in your body, and next thing, your blood pressure drops, and ultimately, you die. Without water, the average person, next slide please, will live for three days. After three days without water, most people will die. Sennacherib was going to come and surround the city. In three days, they would have to capitulate unless they found a source of water. Now, I'm going to jump the track a little bit here because I'm not just talking about water here today, folks. I want to talk about living water. Praise the Lord. Anybody ever hear of living water? Living water? Living water is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Not just on the outside, but in you, having the Holy Spirit in you is living water, and it's something else that sustains us in different ways, but it sustains us. Let's see what Jesus said to the woman at the well. Let's look at the next slide. He says to this woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, now he's at a well, he said you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. These are the words of Jesus, our Savior. Now he's talking to a woman at the well and trying to tell her that a relationship with Almighty God involves having a relationship not only with the Father, not only with the Son, but with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will come into you and be a source of strength, a source of life, a source of joy, a source of peace, a source of inner strength. If you're going to be victorious, you're going to have to be resilient in the day of trials. And the way to be resilient in the day of trial is to have living water on the inside of you. You can say, Holy Spirit, I want you in me. You could say that right now to yourself if you're here. Holy Spirit, I want more of you in me. Praise God. And just like real water without the Holy Spirit, you go a week or two without the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit and you're going through problems, you may find yourself depressed, discouraged, anxious. Everything begins to get out of control. You begin to get confused. You begin to get worried too much. Why? Because of the lack of the presence of God on the inside of us. Praise God. Look what Jesus said, the second part of that. Can you put that slide back up, please, for a second? 
Whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. It means you will never thirst spiritually. You will have spiritual strength, which in turn provides emotional strength to live life and to keep your head above water, so to speak. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Praise God. How am I going to live to be 120? Living water and Gatorade. <laughs> In Amos, the book of Amos chapter 4, it says the people staggered from town to town for water. It was a time of drought, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, said the Lord. See, during a time of fam famine, people are searching for well, searching for water everywhere. And here's what the Lord said. In all your efforts and expending of the energy, you have not sought God. And I wonder how often that's true of us, that we, we, we're going through a whole set of circumstances and we need a job. Our finances are no good. We got physical ailments and difficulties here and this is happening within the family uh, and we got all kinds of problems and we're saying, oh, I got this problem. I got this thing going on. I got that thing uh, uh, going on. And in the midst of all of those problems, what the Lord is saying, are you making sure that you're seeking more of me also? Because what will really sustain you in the midst of all your natural problems is having the supernatural power of Almighty God dwelling within us. Praise God. Hallelujah. Matthew 6.33 said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to you as well. How many of you know that verse? Make sure you're seeking God first and put, putting them in a um, priority place. Okay, let's look at how we obtain this water. Next slide. Just how do you obtain living water? Okay, number one, it's a gift from God. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. It's nothing. It comes by the grace of God. Don't you know the gift of God that's available to you? Luke eleven thirteen. 13, if you then Though your evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? It's not a matter of earning it. It's a matter of asking for it. Lord, I want more of your spirit. I want to be strengthened by your spirit. I want the presence of your spirit in my life. Number two, if you know who Jesus is, John 14, 14 says, you may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. And if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Jesus is a, answers our prayers. So when we ask him for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to give us something else. He's going to give us the Holy Spirit when we ask him for it. If you say, I want more of the Holy Spirit, then go to Jesus, our cornerstone, and say, Lord, I want more of your spirit in my life. And the third element is this. You've got to trust in Jesus with all your heart and soul. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my, my the guide. He's my King. He's my Lord. He's the everlasting one. He's the eternal one. He's the Prince of Peace. Praise God. When I get to heaven, he's going to be there sitting on the throne. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's the King of my heart and the Lord of my heart. Heart. And he said, John 7, 38, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, living water will flow from within them. Believing in Jesus, not just a name, not just a, some teacher, not just some philosophy of being a Christian. It means having the living Christ and knowing the living Christ and having him empowering our life and being our best friend and walking the road of life with us every day and every moment of every day. Praise God. Revelation 7, 17 said, for the lamb was at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus is the one that will meet us at the well 
and say, I got living water for you, brother. I got living water for you, sister. Praise God. Hallelujah. And what will, what are the benefits of having this living water? Number one, put the next slide up, please. It's sustaining power for our emotions, our thoughts, and our spirit. The Holy Spirit sustains us in the day of trouble. Brothers and sisters, I wish I could tell you how many times over the, the, the last well, I wasn't 30 till I got saved and came to know Jesus as my Savior. So I'm going to say over the last 40-something years that I've had still had trouble. You would, I had successes, but I had troubles and problems and difficulties and uh, family issues and illnesses and all kinds of things. But in the middle of those troubles, I would say, Jesus, I need you. I need your strength to get me through. I need your strength today. I don't know if I can make it without you. I need you, Lord. And when I said, I need you, Lord, and I would praise him in spite of my difficulties, I would feel the peace that passes all understanding, filling my heart and soul and giving me strength. Praise God. There are times I felt like I was riding on a cloud because the Holy Spirit would come under me and lift me up and take me through. How'd you make it through that season of your life, Pastor Howard? I had the Holy Spirit, praise God, leading and helping me and strengthening me and sustaining me. I don't know what I would have done without the Holy Spirit in my life. Praise God. In the Bible, it says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Acts chapter 2, verse 8. You'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses unto Judea and Samaria and Judah to the uttermost parts of the world. Some of you have heard that verse. But what does it mean when he says, you'll be able to be my witnesses? You'll be able to maintain your testimony that you're a believer. I had somebody, an elder pastor, tell me one day, Howard, you got to pray and stay filled with the Holy Spirit or you'll crack up. You'll crack up under the strain. You'll crack up under the stress, under the pressure. So you need God and you need the Holy Spirit. And you need it every day, hallelujah. Every day of my life, praise God. I, I, I want you to know, uh, some of you may be more familiar with this than others, but the gift of speaking in other tongues because we're filled with the Spirit. But I speak in tongues virtually every day and sometimes frequently during the day when I'm just alone by myself. I pray in my prayer language to strengthen myself and to be empowered by God. I don't want to leave God for one minute. I don't want to leave God for one day. I don't sometimes want to leave God for one hour. He is my strength. He's my wisdom and he's my power and he helps me and he leads me and he guides me. And with God, I can make it through anything. Praise God. I can do all things things through Christ who strengthens me. Praise him. Can you say amen to that, brothers and sisters? Hallelujah. Okay, number two. <laughs> Put the next slide. It will refresh us. It'll carry away toxic attitudes and stresses. You know, it's hard to be mean when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's hard to be unforgiving when you're full of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will be reminding you to forgive people and to be merciful and to love people, praise God. And so I just find the Holy Spirit to be a refreshing, lubricating power, and it'll take away the toxin, just like water does in your body. Water takes all the waste products, and that's why you go to the bathroom and you get rid of all that stuff with the water carrying it out, flush it down the drain, praise God, and I get some toxic stuff in me from time to time. I can lose my temper a little bit. I thank God today I came down here very early this morning, and I got on Interstate 91 and came across 691, praise God, and the traffic was light, but normally during the week when the traffic is heavy, I find myself losing my grace, losing my patience, losing my love for my fellow men as people are weaving in and out of lanes at 80 miles an hour, nearly running me off the road. I'll tell you, it's enough, but I need the Holy Spirit in those moments. I don't know about you. I need the Holy Spirit in those moments because also I feel like killing somebody. And I'm a pastor. That's not good for a pastor to be feeling that way. Let's look at number three. The Holy Spirit will do something. It'll cool us off. Come on, some of you, some people start, when problems get difficult, they, they start getting hot. They get testy. They get hot. 
I don't know, there's homes where they said, oh, be careful of dad, he's hot today. <laughs> or maybe some homes they say, be careful of mom, she's hot today. And I, well, hot in the meaning, her temper's temper is right. I'm saying temperature, but her temper is rising. So the Holy Spirit will cool us off. In fact, 1 Peter 5 says and says, cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Praise God. He can calm you in the midst of stressful times. Praise God. Next slide says a source of water. They, in Hezekiah's day, they needed a source of water. It said he, he knew they needed water there was a spring called the Gihon Spring just outside the walls of the city. Produced 25,000 gallons of water a day. There was plenty of water outside the wall, but none inside the city where all the people were going to be holed up. So it says in 2 Chronicles 32 that he consulted with officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city. And they helped him. A large force of men assembled and they blocked all the springs of stream that flowed through the land. Why should the king of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. So it was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down the west side of the city of David. So what did he do? Gihon Spring means gusher. There was a gusher of water outside the wall of the city. Now, in Israel, if you've been to Israel, it's all rock over there. Sandstone like but rock. So he got an army of fellows and he started digging a tunnel from where the spring was through solid rock. They went down underground, down underground, down underground, 100 feet deep, down underground, down underground, down, and all the way, people with hammers and chisels. They didn't have jackhammers in those days. They dug a tunnel that was over six feet high and about two to three feet wide for over a third of a mile, dug it by hand through pure stone. And all of the stone that came out from the, from, from the tunnel, they took it out and piled it up over the spring outside the city. So they blocked the spring from Sennacherib by putting a pile of stone out there, a huge pile of stone, and all the water dust went down. They didn't even know the spring was there in through the city, all the way down. Now, what happened when they were building it? They had guys inside the city chiseling uh, from one end down by the Pool of Siloam. You can see it on the bottom left. And then to the Gihon Spring on the far right. It's over a third of a mile long. That's a quite a ways. It's like from, it's a third of a mile about from here up to Interstate 84. That's quite a ways. Maybe, yeah, maybe about right. That's a long way to go. And the people inside were chipping away, and the team from the outside was chipping away. And the interesting thing is, uh, they went 1,770 feet. And they worked from both ends, and then they were hammering it down under the ground, 80 feet under the ground. They were hammering, and the guy said, wait a minute, I hear hammering coming from the other side. So the guy hit his chisel, and he hammered through, and when he broke through, he could see the guy on the other side. Imagine you got uh, one group going about 800 yards, foot, uh, uh, another girl going another 800 yards, and they meet in the middle, exactly in the middle. And they chipped it away, and all of a sudden, all the water from outside the city was flowing into the city. Guess what? Praise God. They had the water to stay hydrated. And guess what happened? When Sennacherib came and surrounded the city, they couldn't find any water. So after three days, they left. Somebody want to say amen? The enemy left. They went to another city. They went to another uh, country to attack there because they said, we can't capture Jerusalem because they have water. They had the well within. They had the water within the walls, and the enemy didn't have any water. Do you know that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, 
The devil doesn't have the same power that you have. You have more power than Satan, than demons, than powers of darkness. You have power over all your enemies. Why? Because you have water flowing through that tunnel. I'm going to tell you something. That picture that I showed you that was taken recently. You can go to Jerusalem today and you still can go through Hezekiah's tunnel. 2,800 years later, there's water still flowing through Hezekiah's tunnel. And guess what? If I live to be 120, fine. When I die, I go to heaven and there'll be living water water inside a Howard Renker for all of eternity. Praise God. And there will be in your life too if you invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Brothers and sisters, what is holding you back from being totally filled with the Holy Spirit? As you enter the new year, isn't this a time to say, God, fill me up. I want your presence in me. I want your strength in me. The Bible said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Have you begun to dig into God? Are you a casual Christian, a part-time Christian, a sometime Sunday Christian, or have you decided to get a chisel out and chisel your way down into the Word of God, down into your faith, and dig a place where the water springs up inside of you? Like Jesus said to the woman at the well, you come, uh, I'll give you living water, and it'll never run dry, praise God. Springs of living water will well up within you. Set aside your anger. Set aside aside the people who hurt you in your past. Set aside the difficulties that you had. Inside. Set apart your losses and it's time in the new year to move forward. Hallelujah. Why not move forward and go deeper with God until that living well rises up inside of you. Hallelujah. And you have strength for daily living to face the challenges of the future and to face the challenges of every day. You know, when you connect with God, the water will fill your heart and be there forever. Last slide, please. Next one. Living water will produce fruit and bless us, giving us peace in the midst of trouble. John 16, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me, in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And with Jesus in us, we will overcome the world too. Praise God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray a prayer in just a moment. And I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to be fresh in my life today. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing wherever you're sitting. If you want to lift your hand up to the Lord, like show him your antenna, you can do that if you like. You don't have to. But maybe you're right where you're sitting. Why don't you open up your heart right now and pray? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Fill my heart today. I need you every hour, Lord. Every precious hour, I need you, Lord. Fill my heart. Help me in my thoughts. Bring me wisdom. Bring me strength. Bring me peace. I want that living water inside of me, Lord. Touch me with your Holy Spirit. And I want to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, fill each hungry heart today. They're pressing into you right now, Lord. They're pressing in and wanting more of you. Help them to face the difficulties of their daily lives, all the problems that come their way. Lord, I'd like to believe that Cornerstone will have a great legacy because its people are strong in the Lord. They're strong in Jesus. They're strong in the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And it's not just Sunday morning, Lord. They're lifting their hands on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. 21 days of prayer coming up during this season of prayer. I hope you'll all join in. And during this time, you'll get closer and closer and closer to God so the well will go deeper. It'll be a gihan, gusher, spring of water welling up in every one of you. And that's what I pray for you today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. God bless you today.